Hello, I'm Jay Shadler. Welcome to our special, Prime Time's Medical Mysteries. We begin tonight with one of the greatest mysteries of all, sleep. It's been called death's little sister, a rather disturbing description that nonetheless targets a truth. In the realm of sleep, reason fades and our control vanishes, leaving us with our first story. Ah, to sleep, perchance to dream, but that's not the half of it. Left to its own devices, the sleeping brain rules an eccentric, sensual, and sometimes violent landscape, which only now is beginning to be illuminated. I tried waking him up, but he would not wake up. Meet Vanessa and Tyson Otts. My clothes were pretty much off, and his clothes were off, and all of a sudden he just rolls back over and goes back to sleep. And I was like, what's going on? I remember the next day I thought she was out of her mind. I was like, yeah, I think I would remember almost having sex with you. There's no way that that happened. The Ots have a strange but altogether real problem. In the five years since they've been married, Tyson Ots routinely initiates sex with his wife when he is completely, utterly asleep. I can see where she would think I wasn't sleeping. Yeah. Or anybody else that hears about it would think that you're not sleeping, but I promise you. Not surprisingly, doctors have given sex while sleeping a nifty little medical-sounding name, sexomnia. Sexomnia, I mean, at first blush, let's face it, that sounds outlandish, right? Right. But it's, <laughs> is it real? It is real. Dr. Nancy Foldvery is the director of the Sleep Disorders Center at the Cleveland Clinic. The people that I've seen with this um, were men. Why does that not surprise me? <laughs> They came in based on the reports of their bed partners. And the stories the bed partners tell are no joke. He gets really aggressive, I guess you could say. He's actually become more physical, like holding me down or taking my shirt off or, you know, forcefully kissing me. The scary part is when you don't know you're doing it. To be holding somebody down against their will when you have no recollection of doing it at all it really did scare me. Is it possible for someone to rape an individual and claim accurately that they were sleeping when they did it. Well, it's possible that people, that a person can have sex without any memory for it during a sleep state. That's possible. In fact, in cases around the world, people have used sexomnia, sometimes successfully, as a legal defense for rape. The knee-jerk response is to say, no way. This is, this is not something that's possible. Dr. Mike Mangan is a research psychologist at the University of New Hampshire. People walk in their sleep, they talk in their sleep. People do all kinds of crazy things in their sleep. And it just hasn't entered the popular mind that sexual behavior is just another type of behavior that occurs in sleep. It's nothing that I'm dreaming about that I can remember. It's just natural reaction or <laughs> instinct or something like that. As for the underlying causes of sexomnia, researchers have begun focusing on what amounts to a mind-body disconnect a disconnect between our primal urge for sex and the brain's cortex, which controls rationality and judgment. Basically what you have is uh, a sexually motivated brain and body and a cortex that is switched off. When that's switched off, you have a sexually activated body that's having its way. Though sexomnia is clearly unusual, researchers say the actual number of cases is underreported, showing up in both men and women but rarely caught on tape. Yet cameras have recorded and captured many other examples of parasomnias, strange behavior rising from the depths of sleep. I woke up with him pounding the pillow right beside my face. I mean, within inches of my face. Lori and Bob Norman have become accidental combatants in a nocturnal prize fight. Repeatedly during their nine-year marriage, a sleep disorder has caused Bob to unwittingly assault his wife. We're sound asleep, and he takes his two hands with his fists together and pounds me on the back of the neck. And I just screamed, and I threw my hands up over my head, and I grabbed his hands as they were coming down again. She's holding my hands, and, and I could feel that I had just been doing this. Keep in mind that in every other way, this is a loving, happy couple. He just exudes this peacefulness. I've been meditating for 35 years and I think of myself as healthy and peaceful. But on the nights that turn violent, Bob often awakes with a dark, strange dream in shades of Hitchcock. I'm watching a flock of 
ducks in the water. And at some point, they started coming towards me. I just had this knowing that I was in danger, that they were going to attack me. But the battle in his brain is also being played out in the bed. I was absolutely sound asleep, and he suddenly kicked me. I mean, really hard. Bob was eventually diagnosed with REM behavior disorder, or RBD, a condition that occurs in that stage of sleep known as REM. In REM sleep, interestingly, the uh, brain is very active. We dream, but otherwise the skeletal muscles, the muscles of the arms and the legs, are paralyzed, and that's the normal state of REM. It's almost a protective effect to be paralyzed so that we cannot move during that state. But for people with Bob's sleep disorder, the natural mechanism that causes paralysis during sleep fails. They're not waking up, they thrash around, they may consider the wife an enemy. Are they essentially playing out their dream? They're acting out a dream. Significantly, researchers have begun linking the odd behaviors of RBD to other, even more serious, neurodegenerative disorders like Parkinson's disease. What is clearly coming out is that REM behavior disorder appears 8 to 10 to 15 years before patients develop Parkinson's disease. Really? So it's, a, it's in many cases a precursor to Absolutely. these neuromuscular problems? Absolutely. It could be extremely scary to think that, you know, five years from now or 10 years from now, I'm going to be progressing through stages of Parkinson's disease. In the meantime, Bob has tried medications that help most RBD sufferers. And together, he and Lori have tried a host of practical ideas to keep Bob sleeping and Lori safe, all to no avail. We've put a row of pillows in between us on the beds. We slept in bigger beds. We moved from a double bed to a queen side bed. We went to twin beds. And I kicked her right across the gap between us. So for now, Bob continues his meditations contemplating the night when he and Lori no longer have to be such strange bedfellows. Now, we promised you a chance to be the doctor and diagnose a real-life medical mystery. During tonight's show, we're going to present a case, a real patient and the doctor who treated her. We'll describe symptoms just as they actually occurred, but as you'll see, medicine is an art, not a science, and sometimes doctors get it wrong. Here's your first clue. Here's the case. Keeley, a five-year-old girl in suburban New Jersey, awoke in the middle of the night with alarming symptoms. Tara is her mom. I heard noise coming from her room at about 4.30 in the morning, 4 o'clock in the morning. So I went into her. I was trying to stand up and I couldn't. I just collapsed on the floor. And I could tell right away that there was something a little bit wrong with her speech. And then she said, Daddy, I'm seeing two of you. I had no idea what was going on. You know, how she could be perfectly fine the day before and be so sick within 12 hours. And I just looked at Tara and I said, we've got to get her to the doctor. I said, all right, if I get to miss school, cool. I had the feeling we were a priority customer. Teams of doctors came in, examined her head to toe. What is going on here? Why is this child half paralyzed? And there are a number of things that would go through a physician's mind when we first evaluated her. Trauma, poisonings, Fulminant infections are always in the differential. You worry about brain tumors and some kind of vascular catastrophe, such as a stroke. The main doctor took us aside and said, we believe that all signs are leading towards a tumor. They definitely wanted to get an MRI of her brain to see if they could see anything. Everything was focusing on her brain. I was scared out of my mind. We found a seat in the waiting room and uh, basically just prayed. We'll give you more clues as the show goes on, but now it's time for you to be the doctor. Do you think Keeley is suffering from A, brain tumor or stroke? B, infection? C, toxic poisoning? Or D, severe immune reaction? Rip Van Winkle slept for 20 years, and when he woke up, didn't remember a thing. Interesting story. What if it were true? Well, it almost is. For two families you're about to meet, coping with a sleeping sickness so strange, few doctors even know about it. Hi, you've reached the Barber family. It is a voice from another time. 
can't get to the phone right now. Please leave a telephone number and a message, and we'll call you back as soon as we can. It is the voice of a young woman who is literally sleeping her life away. It's cruel. It's very cruel. Varda and Neil Farber's daughter, Ariel, is a virtual prisoner in her own bedroom. She will not come out of the room. She will not come downstairs. Trapped there today and for the last year by a mysterious sleeping sickness that causes her to sleep weeks, sometimes months, on end. She has been in bed for almost four years out of the last 12. It all began in 1994 when she returned home from summer camp and headed straight to bed. But she didn't wake up, and it was 24 hours later, and I couldn't wake her up. Couldn't wake her up? I mean, I, mean, I could. She'd respond. But it was like, oh, you know, I'm so tired. Leave me alone. Doctors suspected it was just a simple flu. But she didn't wake up. She was sleeping almost 23 hours out of the 24 of the day. Imagine 23 out of 24 hours for days on end. And in the only hour she was awake, she acted oddly, confused and reverting to almost childlike behavior. There must have been days that you as parents must have felt, I'm dealing with just an obstinate teenager. She Were there was any so days like sick, that? so sick that you know this is not put on. But no one had an explanation for her strange behavior. We had no idea what she was sick with. We assumed it was something viral, something bizarre, related to maybe in camp, who knew what. And then we started blaming the house. Maybe it was an environmental thing. Maybe it had some toxin. Then, one week later, just as suddenly as it began, it ended. But the family's reprieve did not last long. Six months later, their teenage son, Donnie, began developing the same strange symptoms. Even for someone that has gone through this, it's still something that I'm, I have trouble comprehending. Donnie Farber, now 27, has been healthy for over two years, but he lost large chunks of his life, too. In a sense, you, you and your sister hibernate. If 22 hours a day is, I'd classify that as almost a hibernation, yeah. It's a real need close your eyes and go to sleep. And then when you are awake, how's your behavior then? What's it like? It's mm, complete disorientation. I'm, for the most part, just lying in bed, you know, confused about what's going on at that moment. We went through all the battery of tests, EGs and, and MRs. They'll try to rule out all of the things that they think about. Is it something related to seizures, brain tumor? Within that first episode, we also went to a psychiatrist. Went to a because, psychiatrist. You know, we also, you know, because, behavioral changes. But, you worry but what's he going said, on. There's nothing wrong with him. This was unlike anything I'd ever seen. Dr. Michael Rancarello, a pediatric psychiatrist at Allegheny General Hospital, was puzzled too when another teenage boy came into his psychiatry unit with the same troubling symptoms as the Farber children. It just sounded like something that was being put on, actually. I mean, I just felt like saying, look, to his parents, like, just take him home, you know, like, I, and, and kick his butt. I mean, I, you know, this is ridiculous. This baffling case was still open a year later when Dr. Raccarello discovered a medical article about a curious condition called Klein-Levin syndrome, or KLS. It was one of those things where I was guided to it, and I started scanning it, and I thought, this is it. They're, they're describing everything that's wrong with this guy, every single thing. I, I couldn't believe it. KLS is a rare neurological disorder, a disease of the brain that affects basic human needs, primarily a person's urge to sleep. As long as the afflicted person remains in this suspended state, time and memory are lost which is why some have speculated that the old legends of Rip Van Winkle and Sleeping Beauty were born from real-life stories of people with KLS. But of course, for those who suffer now, this is no fairy tale. Certainly, you must both sometimes say to yourself, what would their lives have been like without this? Sure. After so many years, and so many missed opportunities. Time lost. Time lost. And this is not time that you can make up. Kids were both sick when their grandfather passed away. Imagine waking up from an illness and finding out your grandpa has died. That's what happened? That's oh, yes. what happened. Mm -hmm. 
the mystery component has got to be uh, unnerving. It's always scary to not understand something, but when it is regarding your mind and your body, um, it, it's extremely frightening. The fears and mystery of KLS are being faced by roughly 500 people worldwide who share the disease. Consider Nicole Deline. When we first met her, she appeared like any other 10-year-old kid, riding her bike and laughing. But she has been in and out of KLS episodes since she was five years old. Her parents, Harry and Vicki Deline, have kept meticulous records documenting her illness. Sunday, May 19th, 2002. At the time of this writing, 3 p.m., she is still asleep. Wednesday, June 26, 2002. Nicole is still confused and crying today. Thursday, October 17, 2002. Nicole woke up confused and crying uncontrollably. Though Nicole has even more prominent behavioral issues than the Farber children, like them, she has no memory of important milestones in her young life. She had her birthday party, you know, a bowling birthday party. She sat the whole party sitting on her grandfather's lap crying. I mean, she has a bowling pin there with everybody's signature on it. and She had absolutely no memory. It's all didn't happen, except for the bowling pin with the signatures on it. <laughs> the family went for two years without a diagnosis, going from doctor to doctor, test to test, with an ever-present suggestion that her problems were really all psychological. One doctor literally put her through tests for an hour. And I'm talking like walking down the hall, hop on one foot, do this, do that, trying to catch her, trying to see if she would slip, like she was acting, like she was pretending. And another doctor even suspected them of making their daughter sick. She literally pounded on her desk saying, this is behavioral. And then she actually reported us to Children and Youth Services. All four of these families that I've seen along the way got reported to Child Protective Services. When Child Protective Services could not find any evidence of abuse, the Deleens found their way to Dr. Rancarello. I thought, God, this is another kid with Klein-Levin syndrome. I can't believe this. For Nicole Deline and Ariel Farber, one of the most frightening and disheartening aspects of KLS is that it can trick its victims into believing it has vanished. Just last summer, it looked like Ariel had finally turned the corner. She had been healthy and awake for almost a year. She was on top of the world. She wanted to go to graduate school. She applied. She got accepted to George Washington University Ooh. with a scholarship, a merit scholarship. So at that point, it looked like her whole life was she starting. She was set. She had rented an apartment. She had found a roommate. She was starting life. But then, last July, a phone call and words they dreaded. I got a call in the car. I said, I, I'm not feeling very well. It just hits you like a brick wall when you get that call when you say, you know, she'll say, I think I'm getting sick. Because we've been just... through this, you know, with both our children, we've been through this now 40 times. But unfortunately, every time when they say they think they're getting sick, it's been, it's been the case. In short, we yeah. hung up the phone and we both cried, you know. Over the years, the Farbers tried whatever they could to help their children. What kinds of medications have been tried? Probably every medicine that has any kind of activity and anything that looks like KLS has been tried. Anti-epileptics, anti-schizophrenics. Unfortunately, nothing's, nothing's had any impact. Their heartache and frustration eventually led the Farbers to help form a KLS foundation to raise awareness and search for a cure. And our challenge here was to find top laboratories, people who had an interest and an expertise in these kinds of illnesses. For six long years, they searched in vain for a top research scientist who would take on their case. Finally, in 2004, Stanford University's Dr. Emmanuel Mignon, the man who uncovered the cause of narcolepsy, agreed to investigate KLS. Klein Levin syndrome as a disease is very fascinating. If we can understand the cause of Klein Levin syndrome, we might understand something really uh, unique about uh, you know, very basic instincts. Dr. Mignot and his team started by collecting blood samples and patient histories from affected persons all over the world. 
And what they found may be the biggest clue yet to uncovering the mystery of the disease. They discovered a higher predisposition in the Jewish population than any other. For a disease to run in family doesn't mean that it's genetic. For example, the flu runs in family. When my kid has a flu, I get the flu. But with a Jewish predisposition, it makes even a stronger case for at least a gene being involved. So now they are starting to search for that gene using high-speed computers that are able to analyze and isolate DNA faster than ever before. And I hope that in one portion of one chromosome, I will find a big signal that suggests that there is a block of gene that has been passed on to all these patients with KLS. Dr. Mignot is optimistic that they may be able to find a gene in the very near future, which could eventually lead to a treatment. Of course, until then, for those afflicted with KLS, time keeps slipping away. Just after our interview, Nicole Deline was struck again by the disease. Those vibrant images we recorded when we first met her were replaced with these. And during the time she was awake, her parents say her compulsive behaviors were repetitive, almost robotic. As for the Farbers, they had hoped Ariel, like many KLS patients, would grow out of the disease when she reached young adulthood. But instead, it seems to be intensifying. And so now, for over a year, Ariel has laid in this second floor bedroom, the house quiet, like a church or a tomb. The stillness broken only occasionally, as Ariel's mother prepares just enough food for her daughter's survival. Are you worn down completely? I mean, it's got to just be overwhelming at times. It's, it's uh, does its number on you. If I could speak to her, as her... I wish you could. What do you think she'd want us to know about this disease? It's uncontrollable. It's not within her control or ours. Um, that it overtakes your life. And, uh, and you struggle as hard as you can to fight back. Let's go back to the real life case you're trying to solve, or should I say diagnose at home. Your votes are in. See if America agrees with you. Here's how the percentages stack up. Do you think the vote is accurate? That you've nailed the diagnosis? Now we go back to the case to see if you were right and would have found a way to cure five-year-old Keeley. It's time to follow the case again as the doctors continue their tests and the parents continue their hospital vigil. Remember, little Keeley woke up with slurred speech, blurred vision, unable to stand. Doctors have done an MRI looking for a brain tumor. We were in the waiting room for a while, and then the doctor came out and said everything looked fine. There was no sign of a tumor. There was no sign of an aneurysm. So then we embarked on really trying to think about every other possibility of rapidly progressive weakness in a young child. They came in and they were asking a whole lot of questions about what her exposure was to different things. Well, there are a number of poisonings that can cause weakness. The most classic is botulism. In years gone by, polio could present this way. Polio is very rare in the United States. And then tick paralysis, an illness brought on by the bite of certain species of ticks. Well, I think they went on history for a lot of things as far as eliminating the botulism and the polio and the ticks and things like that. We then shifted our thinking a little bit to consider Guillain-Barre syndrome, which is a poorly understood illness where your body creates an immune reaction against the nerve roots in the spinal cord. It does present with weakness in the legs, progressing upwards through the body, eventually affecting the arms, and then the respiratory muscles, at which point it becomes a life-threatening illness. It was a disease I had never heard of and to start this process they would need to do a spinal tap. We were concerned that her weakness was progressing right before our eyes. Once again it's time for you to be the doctor. Do you think Keeley is suffering from A, brain tumor or stroke, B, infection, that's the polio or botulism, C, toxic poisoning, tick paralysis, or D, severe immune reaction, Guillain-Barre syndrome? They weren't depressed, they weren't on drugs, and they were not loners. Yet two healthy young men tried to kill themselves in the middle of the night, or so it seemed. 
The mystery here is they were sound asleep. So how did one of them end up dead? He was considered a prodigy, one of the bright hopes of Canada's tennis future. At 17, Peter Polanski was ranked number one on their junior circuit. And this past April, he was in Mexico with the Canadian team for an international match. But he would never get the chance to play. The next thing I know, my phone's ringing at 12.30 at night. Sports medicine expert Marlene Nobrega was traveling that night with the team. It's a Spanish-speaking gentleman who says to me, you're the doctor for Team Canada. And I'm just like, yes, yes. And he's like, you must come now. A guest has fallen. Certain that there had been a mistake, she politely hung up. And the phone rang immediately again, and it was our team captain. And he just screamed in the phone and said, Marlene, it's Peter. Come now. Peter Polanski had jumped out of his hotel window. Marlene was one of the first on the scene. How did he get out the window? Well, it was shut, so he turned his back to the glass and then kicked it out. He fell out the window backwards. Backwards from a third-story window. He tried to sit up, and he saw that he was bleeding. He saw the pool of blood on the ground. And then Peter just started screaming, you have to help me, I'm dying. Seriously wounded but still conscious, Peter told Marlene what he could remember. He said he thought someone was in his room attacking him, and he tried to get away. But when hotel security investigated, they found that no one had entered or left the room except Peter. So all the physical evidence indicated there was no one in that hall, there was no one attacking That's right. Peter. That's right. But what would cause Peter to panic so violently, to break a window and throw himself out of it? He survived barely, only because a hedge cushioned his fall. I looked at my legs and it was just cut open like a grapefruit. I, I couldn't believe it. Today, Peter can tell us what terrified him so badly that he nearly took his own life. I saw a black figure with like a knife. Like a shadow figure. Just standing by my bed towards where the door was. So I just said to myself, like, I need to get away and just kind of crept into my dream. It was all a dream. A dream that nearly drove him to his death. Yeah, I could have been on, like, the 10th floor and it wouldn't have mattered. What do you think brought it on? I don't know. I, it's, it's just weird. Weird, but true. Turns out Peter Polanski nearly died by sleepwalking. Sleep disorders are incredibly more prevalent than most people used to believe. Dr. Mark Mahawald is one of the world's experts on sleep disorders and believes Peter was almost certainly sleepwalking the night of the accident. Sleep terrors are characterized often by a sense of impending doom and a need to escape. And that's why people head toward windows and if they're on the third or fourth floor, then they end up in real trouble. Normally, when we sleep, we pass through three stages. Wakefulness, where the brain is active, but the muscles start to relax. Non-REM sleep, where the brain waves slow down, but the muscles are still active. And REM sleep, where the brain activity returns to just as active as when a person is awake, yet there's a complete paralysis of voluntary muscles. But Dr. Mahawald says these stages can blend into each other, causing people to sleepwalk. And sometimes when people sleepwalk, they have fatal accidents that are wrongly labeled suicide, a term he calls pseudo-suicide. What really led us to this is very dramatic episodes of undoubtedly sleepwalking behavior that, had they been fatal, the cause of death would clearly have been attributed simply to suicide. Which brings us to a dark stretch of road in Iowa and the tombstone of Jared Allgood. Well, never in my wildest dreams would I ever think I'd lose a child to this disease. Never. In 1993, Becky Allgood's world was shattered when police showed up at her door with word that her 21-year-old son, Jared, had sprinted into the path of a semi on Highway 30 just south of Cedar Rapids. He had died instantly. All I know is that the kids, the other kids, heard me scream, this awful scream, and then I got sick. And, that's, and, then, and then I started asking questions. 
but the police had already been asking their own questions to Jared's college roommate, Jeff Harris. I was in total shock when it happened. We didn't have any enemies, so I didn't think it was anything foul play that would have done it. Not foul play. Drinker, drugs? No. So you could rule out everything else? Yeah. And then all of a sudden they were asking me, you know, if you'd been depressed or anything. So right away the police were asking questions that were directing them toward a suicide. Yeah. I just knew it wasn't right. Jared wasn't a depressed kid. I mean, it, it wasn't right. So suicide wasn't even a possibility? Not, not for me. But if not suicide, what then? His puzzling path stretched from his college apartment, across deserted sidewalks, and finally onto a four-lane highway, a quarter-mile trip that made no sense to Jared's mother. And I said, Jeff, tell me, what's, tell me, because I knew he would tell me true. And I told her everything that I knew, and then I, I said that he was in his boxer shorts. And he said he was in his underwear. And I was, oh, man. One curious detail, and it suddenly all began making sense. Becky asked Jeff if her son had mentioned having dreams. He had told me it was probably a month before this happened that he had a dream. Some guy was chasing him, and he just had to get to Bertram. There had been this recurring dream. Yes, he'd had this recurring dream, and he was running a foot race. He was running a race with a man from Bertram, and that Bertram is down on that road. For Becky, Jared's dream and his reality collided in a revelation. And I said, oh my God, Jeff, he was sleepwalking. Oh my God. It is, of course, impossible to know with any certainty what was going through Jared's brain as he ran toward his death here on Highway 30. But evidence suggests that sleepwalkers may have a heightened pain threshold. Could a man, a nearly naked man, run barefoot into a cold Iowa winter night and never wake up? The answer is yes. It's cold. Iowa cold. Iowa cold. The obvious question is, wouldn't that wake you up if you were sleepwalking? Well, but Jared would get sick in his sleep and never wake up. So, you know, he, how can you get sick in your sleep and not wake up? There have been instances where people have accidentally shot themselves in the leg while sleepwalking, and it wasn't until the sleepwalking was over that they realized that they'd injured themselves. So pain is generally not perceived or minimally perceived during sleep. Though Dr. Mahawald believed Jared's behavior that night was consistent with sleepwalking, local authorities were initially skeptical, and there were reports around town that Jared had committed suicide. When you first went to the coroner and said, this is sleepwalking. Mm -hmm. This was sleepwalking. Right. What was his reaction? He just didn't believe it. No, they don't do that. Only children sleepwalk. That's what he told me. So the actual de death certificate, the original claimed death, death certificate was unknown. undetermined. Undetermined. And I said, no, it needs to say it hit by a truck while sleepwalking. You need to say in there why he died. That's when Becky called in Dr. Mahawal to help her make her case. The primary determinant of whether someone is going to be a sleepwalker or not is a positive family history. There was some history of sleepwalking in the family? Yeah, all of my kids walk in their sleep. All of them? All of them. Now, Jared had night terrors. He never woke up. He just would scream. Jared's sleep history, his fateful dreams, and his mother's persistence eventually convinced Iowa's chief medical examiner to make a bold decision. Jared's official cause of death was changed to sleepwalking. I believe that it's the first death certificate that's ever in this state that they've even acknowledged uh, sleep disorders in any way. Since nearly 4% of adults in America sleepwalk, experts now believe there may be other sleepwalking deaths that have been mistakenly labeled suicide. It is ultimately an odd and curious way to die. I mean, that's the honest truth, isn't it? Yes, it is. If you were to have told me that my son would die this way, I wouldn't have believed that. Sure. Yet it happened. As for tennis star Peter Polanski, he's trying hard to put his sleepwalking nightmare behind him. Does it scare you that it did, in fact, come out of nowhere and that you could have it again? A little, but, you know, I think it was just kind of like a one-time thing, just like a fluke, and hopefully it doesn't happen. And... Today, Peter is on the mend and working on a tennis comeback. He's already come up with a practical solution to his sleepwalking problem. From now on, when I travel or go anywhere, I'll 
have to get a room on the first floor and no windows, <laughs> no nothing in the basement. <laughs> when we come back, how you voted at home on our Solve It Yourself medical mystery. Were you able to figure it out before the doctors? We promised you a medical mystery you could solve at home. So here's how you did diagnosing tonight's case. This is what you thought little Keeley was suffering from. Did the rest of the armchair physicians see it the same way you did? Now let's find out what she really had as the doctors find their way to a cure. Now we go back to the case to see if you were right and would have found a way to cure five-year-old Keeley. Remember, in this case, the little girl woke up with sudden muscle weakness, slurred speech, and blurred vision. There was no brain tumor, and doctors were checking the fluid around her spine. The doctors did a spinal tap. That was kind of excruciating. I was in pain. That hurt. Her mother was comforting her, I think, after the procedure, stroking her hair. My mom felt something right here next to my ear and then my dad looked at it and he said that it was a tick. I started jumping up and down and uh, I ran to the hallway and yelled it out. It's a tick. It's a tick. Someone ran out and got a suture kit to remove the tick and they came in and they said, oh, do you want to do it? You do this all the time because I told them I was a veterinarian. So they gave me the instrument and I pulled the tick off. Tick paralysis is something that happens in dogs, particularly hunting dogs in certain areas of the country and it's something where you pull the tick and they get better almost immediately. So in a sense, it's as if the tick is actually giving you a little IV infusion of its toxin. I mean, to go from a potentially life-threatening illness to a cure by removing a tick with a pair of tweezers was really a wonderfully gratifying experience and taught us all a lesson we'll carry with us for the rest of our careers. So those of you who voted for option C, Toxic poisoning, tick paralysis, you were right. Keeley was fine after the tick's toxins cleared her system. For all of us here at Primetime, I'm Jay Shadler. Good night and sweet dreams.